to Second Saturday TV. I'm your host, Alfonso Severo. We have a really exciting show today. I have a special guest, Professor X. Hello. And we're going to be talking about digital security, cyber security. And as if you notice the surroundings, we're not in our usual spot. Well, we're in the conference room at Brick Arts in downtown Brooklyn, the good old People's Republic of Brooklyn. And we have a, a number of folks in the conference room, and uh, we're going to have questions on cybersecurity. Professor X, it's always good to see you. You as well. Thank yeah. you for having me. Oh, it's great. Simple question for people out there. What is cybersecurity? So... Cybersecurity is how we want to protect the behavior of users and their data when they're interacting with the internet. So if I place an order and I use the internet to do that, maybe I don't want my credit card information to get stolen or leaked somewhere. That's a part of cybersecurity. Okay. What are the reasons why it is important to be conscious, aware of issues in cybersecurity? So cybersecurity and then also digital or cyber privacy mm -hmm. are kind of intertwined fields. Um, Is the difference between security and privacy? There, in practice, there's kind of a difference, right. but they're very much related. Um, so sometimes in security, we might use, in digital security, um, we might use maybe different kinds of mathematical functions to protect data. Those same functions right. will appear in conversations about privacy as well. Um, but when it comes to like practicing it, if someone hires like a privacy engineer, they're going to focus on different kinds of problems, but related problems. Um, and cybersecurity, similar idea, very much in the same space, same department probably. Right. Yeah. Now this whole area of cybersecurity and digital security really, really blown up in the last presidential election, uh, where the election was hacked and by a number of different sources. Uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, so, so I think one of the things that kind of happened with privacy, a lot of people didn't really have privacy as much on their minds. Exactly. Um, there was exactly. kind of, there was a Snowden leaks that came out so many years ago, yeah. um, but a lot of people still kind of brushed it off, like, oh, and the government's not doing anything. Um, but I think one of the things we saw in the 2016 election is that some of the data that we were putting out there was kind of used in this whole orchestration right. between a lot of US corporations, corporations in the UK, and then even different governments, right. um, like in Russia, for example, coming in and interacting with our elections right. in the because US. Because that, that was different. I used to think prior to that, in terms of um, cybersecurity, that it was mainly about uh, identity theft, and that was it. But this is something much different in terms of government usage. Uh, of it, uh, and I and when I was looking at, up some information, I came across this term, and I should have known this term, but it's used in a different way: social engineering. Can you uh, explain what we mean by this social engineering as it relates to uh, digital and private security? Yeah. So social engineering, maybe in a snarky way, you could call it really evil marketing. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but in another way, it can be thought of as when you interact with social systems or people, you're not really interacting with them like they're, like they're normal humans, like they're people or persons you would know. You're interacting with them, trying to like play on like little triggers to kind of manipulate a system in a kind of way. Psychological warfare. It could be, yeah. Like a con man would be a very good example of someone in psycho en social engineering. Um, but with the 2016 elections, we had so much data and a very intimate view into people's natural, like their home lives, their work lives, so many different aspects of their social relationships. This was used in a whole new scale to kind of target people just very, almost like a surgeon, and I'm going from very specific areas. So that data was protected or was not protected or were easy accessible to foreign governments or any other persons interested in that data? So in one sense, there was some security. Maybe I would expect people not to be able to get into my Facebook account if I had one. Um, but then in another sense, the, a lot of the data was kind of, it was taken out of the context that people expected. Um, so maybe if I'm like, I'm on Facebook and I was doing a simple quiz 
a small personality test and then the result mm -hmm. is I find out maybe what kind of leaf I am or what special element I have associated with me. Um, that There's kind of like a coded personality test you take without yeah, realizing it and then it can be used in a whole new way um, by the person who delivered the test within Facebook's rules. Is there any social media that's 100% protected or that's not possible? On the internet, it's largely not possible. Um, if you post something, anyone who has access to it, even if it's not the government and if it's not the corporation or the person hosting the website, if I or someone were to see the content online, they could always just take a screenshot and post it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. If it's a video or something, they can record it on their own end and post it somewhere. So you should always think that if it's online, for the most part, it can be infinite. The only thing, or one of the few things that protects information in that way is encryption and cryptography. Sure. And that's you know, pretty safe. Yeah. That will that that will allow online purchasing with use of credit cards, am I correct? Yes. And that's pretty safe. That is pretty safe. There's always ways to kind of like exploit. And so one of the biggest things hackers might go for, um, they might not attack the encryption but they might subvert it. Maybe there's a bug in the system overall that's much easier to handle. Or maybe back to social engineering, maybe you might call customer service and pretend to be someone else. That's where fraud can come in and you can get access that you okay. normally wouldn't have. Now, one second. You're low. So yeah, so you're low. You're a lot lower than he is. Why? I'm talking loud. Because you're moving left. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, talk. Uh, uh, yeah. Question? Okay, so where would you want us to start over? No, 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 no. Pick up from there, but just be mindful moving forward to project. Okay. Yeah, and I want to ask a question. Wait, I'm not yeah, there yet. I'll get there. Right. Um, <laughs> how about the issue of online banking? Uh, how secure is online banking? I know people who say, I will never bank online because I'm afraid I may get at or other people who have access to my information. How secure is that? So I feel it's secure enough where I do online banking, but I also understand that with any kind of system, there can be different risks. So a lot of that is up to your bank and how they want to protect it, um, protect your banking processes. So some banks, for example, may have an over-the-phone password, but if I'm thinking with a security mindset, if I hear you say you're over-the-phone password, then that's like a piece of information that I might have. Um, attacks like that, um, are called like, they're referred to as intimate partner kind of based attacks. Normally in that situation, you already know the person or the person knows you. Mm -hmm. It's not always like an invisible hacker. Um, but then you do have situations where maybe you haven't updated all the software on your phone, then if there's more bugs, things that were supposed to be secure can be subverted and you could get access. So the phone is just, just as exposed as a uh, hard drive, a regular computer or a laptop. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that, um, okay. but there are best practices to make sure your stuff is secure to a decent level. Um, so one of them, for example, is making sure that all the apps on your phone and on your laptop are up to date. Um, a lot of times companies will discover a bug or they'll hire somebody to look for bugs in their own software. When those are found, the company will then try to patch up the bugs. Um, there's always going to be more and more bugs, but it's a continuous battle. Um, but then the idea is like, okay, we've got the latest and greatest thing. Right. Make sure you update unless somebody takes advantage of the old stuff. Okay. So the, av the average person who uh, uses the internet and social media and, you know, Google and whatever, what are some tips that they can do to make sure their security is in, in place? So a lot of stuff, let's say like Facebook or Instagram, they have built-in features where you can say like, oh, I'm posting something, but I want to set my privacy settings so mm -hmm. that certain people can't see it. So that's one thing you can do. For example, Instagram lets you have entirely an, um, um, private accounts. Right. So only people you allow access will see that. Um, even on Instagram, if you share certain posts, if your account is set to private, and it's this post that you posted in the Instagram platform is shared to someone else, then they won't be able to see it. But that is within Instagram. So for example, if I'm on my computer, maybe more tech savvy, if I tell my computer to record the post or take a screenshot of the post and then I send it, that would be a way around it. Um, right. But in terms of built-in privacy settings, that's definitely one of the ways to go. Okay, so if I have a private setting and, and, and 
uh, let's say you have a private setting and you send me some information, gets to my computer. Now, can I share that information? So, one, because it's private in terms of coming to me, but once I have it, are there ways in which I now can share it? So, in one sense, yes. So, if I have like just data on my mm -hmm. computer, just ones and zeros that I transmit it to yours, maybe by a flash right. drive or an email, right. um, then you would have those zeros and ones on your computer. If it was mathematically protected in some kind of way with cryptography, yeah. you might be holding on to the data, but if you don't have the key to unlock it, you can't really see what's inside of it. You can't make sense of it in a way. Right. Um, okay. All right. We have uh, a, uh, a number of guests here, and we're going to come right back and open this up for questions. These internet softwares that you can buy at Target, how good are they? Or are they just a piece of crap? So the question is, we have McAfee often on our computers, um, like different software. Um, but sometimes we can go to, let's say, like a store like Target and buy other pieces of software to put on our, on our computers. So the question is, how good are those pieces of software? Um, so I just want to be on the same page. When you say pieces of software, do you mean like some kind of security thing to help yeah, protect you? Inter internet security, we've heard of um, uh, this company without saying the name, which is the best that you should have on your computer, protecting your computer, which is the worst that you should not have on your computer at all because it gives you viruses. Protecting your computer from viruses has become a billion dollar industry. So, so the question then was about like security-based software. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what is the best, I personally prefer to use Avast and Malware Bytes. Um, I don't get those from Target. I get those online by going to the company website directly. Um, so one of the things, that's just my personal use. I also think it depends on your needs as a user. So for example, it can be very difficult to remember all of the different passwords you might have. People sometimes write their passwords down, um, not realizing it's insecure, or they might make really easy guessable passwords or just say like password one, two, three or something. That's the most pop one of the most popular passwords is just password, which makes it really easy to hack. Um, so what some security softwares will do is they'll have what's called a password manager built in. So a password manager can be set up where it'll enter your password into the interface as you need it, or you can access it and say like, okay, I wanna get in on this website or whatever service, let me look in my secure password manager, this is the service, this is the password, and then you can just put it in there. Um, and then what help, it helps because it's supposed to be secure. Normally there's encryption features and you just have to remember one really good password, and then you have access to all of them. Um, and so that can be seen as like a point of failure um, or a, a very high risk point of entry. Um, that is, would be like a valid criticism. Um, but in terms of like, but, but in many ways, it's still better than what a lot of people are doing. Um, normally the passwords, it'll automatically generate them. So you don't have to remember it and they're generated to be hard to guess. And so it's a huge tool. Um, I don't know if McAfee has that. Um, I think Avast has it, but for my purposes, I usually have like a, secure storage, and then I do it. And how much should a person invest in internet security, such as McAfee or Ed Desk? How much would you, you have to spend to get good security on your computer? So to get good, so the question was, how much should a person spend to get good security on their computer? So I personally think a lot of the best things a person can do for their computer would be making sure all of their software is up to date. Um, Windows will often do that. If you have Linux or Mac, they'll often help you do that. Sometimes it's automatic, sometimes it's not. Um, sometimes there's valid maybe privacy concerns over whatever Microsoft and Mac and Apple, and, excuse me, Microsoft, Apple, and Linux are installing on your computer. Um, there can be concerns there, but it's still a lot better than just having open holes on your computer to be taken advantage of. Those would probably be the number one things you can do. Okay. Uh, questions? Yeah, I got a question. So um, I've been using Mac for the last uh, 12, 
know who he is, that's who he is. And I've never had a virus or a half or anything like that. I used to use, I was a PC guy, you know, for a long time, but I used to get, um, you know, crashes, things were incompatible, and, um, and a lot of, of like spyware, bloatware, all types of malware. So, um, so I, the conclusion I came to was that Matt kind of figured it out that you don't really have these issues with um, on you know on Mac's uh, platforms that, that you do on Windows. You know, do you have any experiences on, on that? So the question was, a lot of people find Mac to be more secure than your typical PC. Um, some people have used them for decades and they still find Mac to be so much better. They don't have the same problems with maybe viruses or bloatware or compatibility issues they do with Windows. And so the question is just my experience or my take on that. So I want to say before, there's, a, there's an idea that Macs cannot be hacked that sometimes people have. Uh, this is not true. Any computing system can be hacked. Um, so I'm reading a lot of like, dirty glares, but it's true, it's true. Um, you can go online and look up like bugs on Mac or most recent hacks and they will show you examples. Um, in terms of the security processes of Windows versus Mac, um, part of it is the prevalence of use of one operating system over the other that makes it a, maybe a sweeter target. There's also different updating practices that people sometimes don't practice. A lot, of, a lot of infrastructure, public infrastructure, or a lot of older, or a lot of companies that aren't adjusting in the same pace, um, maybe using very old or outdated versions of Windows, for example, and that can be a huge point to attack. Um, so Windows is kind of like a sweeter target in that way. Um, in terms of, you know, is Mac inherently more secure? Did they figure it out? Um, they're still gonna have issues. From what I understand about Mac, they do have like a, Apple has a way of practicing security that I usually hear from my other colleagues in security that they look much, they think is much better than it is for Windows. So there is something that I'm hearing about it being good. Um, but I wouldn't ever think like, oh, Mac is perfect. I can do anything and everything. Um, I wouldn't have that mindset. Okay. My question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, my question is, can you explain exactly what data points are and how many data points does the average internet user have? So the question is... You can use the board if you need it. Okay. So the question was, can I explain what data points are and how many data points does the average internet user have? So, so one of the ways to kind of think about data is like, did I record something or harness some piece of information, even if that information wasn't digital, maybe it was in like the real world, the material world, um, how could I interpret that? So for example, maybe if I got someone's height, I could say like, oh, that person is six feet tall. You could interpret that as a data point. But if we build this into like a cohesive set of data, if we aggregate it, maybe we'll digitize it after we get our measurements, maybe people will type in information. There's all different ways to collect this you can build a very rich data set on individuals and communities um, and just other groups of people. So in terms of how many data points does an individual have on them, um, I don't know if I or anyone could give like a strong or a good answer um, because it would really be like what practices does this person interact with? Um, and then it could also be interpreted that the amount of data we generate like as a people um, is growing. Right, so like you know, whatever number I give today, it might be wildly out of date by tomorrow. Um, one thing that can be said then is, you know, how identifiable is a person on the internet? How exposed am I? Um, and so there's different tests you can do. You know, you can try getting on Google or whatever search engine you prefer. I prefer StartPage, sometimes DuckDuckGo. Um, you can use those search engines and type in your name, and then you can see what pops up. You can try maybe going in incognito mode or getting in on a different browser, looking yourself up on LinkedIn to see if certain things are gonna pop up or not. Um, there's usually a lot of public databases. So for example, maybe if you went to an older school or maybe if you like work at some kind of facility where they have like a public directory, 
maybe then that can be exposed. Um, so there's different ways to kind of figure out how much of you is out there. Um, and it's going to be, it's usually quite a lot um, and an increasing amount. Question, uh, if you had false information uh, or false, false data uh, on, on a particular um, guru or some other site, how do you go about getting rid of it? So the question is, if you have false data or if there is false data about you on some website, that's very popular on Google or something, what can you do about it? So this is an open problem in a lot of ways. Um, so on one hand, maybe you can try writing to the person hosting the website. Let's say it's like a very popular company. They might have a customer support or something you can interact with to say like, hey, this is dishonest. Um, if there's different things you can do for like proving you are who you say you are and that there was fraud involved, you can do things about that. Um, but we live in interesting times. There's a thing, so there's a, there's a whole area of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, one of the things that recently came out of that are thing called generative adversarial neural networks, or they're called GANs for short, G-A-N-N. -N. And so what they do is they can be used to just artificially generate content that maybe looks realistic, right? It learns to look realistic because it's playing a game against other machines that can detect against it. So one of the ways this has unfortunately been used is to create very realistic looking pieces of media that, that are they're, they're fake, right? It could be very powerful for, for use in fake news. Um, if you consider that and then other digital editing techniques, you can build like a very powerful like framework for propaganda or just false information. Um, so you have things called deep fakes, for example, where deep fakes, so they're called deep fakes because of the nature of the, the algorithms that are used to subscribe them. And so you can talk about like, here's a picture of someone's face, um, now generate an image or some content of them doing something maybe perverse or acting in some way that they actually didn't do. Um, so that's called the, so that, that content that comes out is called a deep fake. And so then those are kind of like spreading around on the internet. And it's kind of an open problem because things are kind of infinite on the internet. If I have a piece of information, I could share it to a thousand people very quickly. They could share it to more people. I could hold a copy on my computer. And so that's like an open problem. I know some countries are trying to say like this is illegal. Um, if you have deep fakes or if you're spreading them, you can be prosecuted. Um, but it's, it's kind of new. It isn't even like five years old, um, if even three years old. My question is, how did you get started with internet security? Was it a time when you just woke up and said, hey, you know something? I need to get involved in this internet security business because I think there's a market for it. What, what, in, what inspired you? So I personally got interested in security and privacy from something of, maybe, sorry, so the question was, what inspired me or what got me into digital security and privacy in the first place? So for me personally, I had a background in mathematics, and so I could kind of follow some of the stuff that I was reading when it got very technical. Um, I didn't know how to program, but through my general interests and kind of looking at YouTube tutorials and just different stuff online, I learned how to program and I got into it that way. What got me into privacy in particular um, I, it was very, it was kind of political for me. I saw some of the stuff that was happening in 2016 as I was getting an understanding of different ways we could use machines and computers to like generate information or learn information. I saw how rich some of the data that was being collected is and what it could be used to do. Um, and so I, I got personally involved with NY, there's a, I was a part of like a, a coalition in New York City, the NYC Privacy Board Advocates. And so now NYC has like a privacy, like a board that kind of looks out for the citizens of New York's privacy. And so that's like I had help starting that. And so I think from there, it just kind of kept going. Um, and so someone told me that, hey, this professor is doing stuff with privacy and they're doing stuff kind of with like a, maybe like a, a civic kind of angle. So I messaged them and we had a conversation and then I went and did some research there. And now I'm back in New York, um, trying to keep it going. Wow, professor. That is very, very interesting. Uh, time is going fast. And if there's one thing you can leave with the audience in, t in reference to um, 
cyber security and their own securing information on their computer or online? What would that be? So the question was, what is one or maybe a few small things that I would say people should do if they want to be secure um, digitally and privately? I would say make sure all of the apps on your phone are updated um, or in, on your computer as well. Um, if there are apps on your phone you don't use or even on your computer, I would just delete them, um, uninstall them, um, because then they're just, they're, just, they're just waiting vectors for attack for hackers and they could be spying on you anyway. Um, I recommend personally, I don't like to use Google when I want to look for information. I prefer StartPage. Some people prefer DuckDuckGo. And then for texting, um, I use Signal. Um, it's an app, and it'll auto-encrypt your messages when you send them to other Signal users. But if you just want to text and you don't want to have to jump back and forth between messaging apps, you can use Signal to streamline all of your texts through one app. And then if you want to text somebody who doesn't have Signal, it'll just send it as a regular message, and Signal will let you know. But if you text someone who does have Signal, it'll be encrypted, and you'll be able to see that. OK. Uh, Professor X, I'd like to thank you for being on Second Saturday. This has really been a wealth of information. And uh, extend an invitation for you to come back in the near future. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, cyber security is an important, cyber and digital security is an important part of our life. And as we, technology takes over more and more of our lives, it becomes even more and more important. Well, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again on the next Second Saturday.